as the dominant model of who is a leader or what leadership should be. And I think that, for me at least, that was particularly important because in Nigeria we're coming out now of, what, more than three decades of military authoritarianism where when the military or, quote-unquote, your leader says, jump, you don't wait around to say how high, you jump and hope you've jumped to the right level, whatever it is. Okay? And a situation that got worse and worse towards the latter years of military authoritarianism. There's some new Nigerians in the group, so I'm just making sure that they're nodding here as I talk about it. But secondly, in terms of that, we were talking about women's disadvantages in terms of developing formal leadership. Because as Charlotte said, women have always exercised leadership in particular invisibilized, unrecognized ways. But in terms of developing formal leadership skills, there are a whole host of different contextual, but often similar across different contexts, issues that we had to deal with around social, who, which societies socially accept women as leaders, that women should have power. Around the educational, where and how do women have opportunities and access to develop educational skills that would give them confidence in a public arena? around the political, not just the formal political citizenship rights, but also around legal protections in practice and around the recognition of women's right to speak in the public arena and to, to intervene in the public arena at all. All represented in things, I'm sure Kumi stole this, uh, this, uh, example, this metaphor from me, in things like <laughs> the National Assembly when it was built in Lagos didn't have toilets for women, period. Not that they were inadequate, it just didn't have any. Because of course, I mean, who's going to expect women to be parliamentarians? But in addition, um, many of us also have the, the issue that we have to deal with a particularly truncated and skewed view of what is the traditional. In societies where what is considered to be the traditional is validated, in part at least, as a reaction to colonial intervention and cultural imperialism. Okay? And this is one in which very often what is currently defined as traditional is a version that is even more male dominant than it m might have been prior to colonial intervention and cultural imperialism and words that for a couple of years we weren't allowed to say in public because they weren't PC, but which nonetheless existed, and which doesn't recognize, doesn't understand, that very often the versions that we have today were version, are versions that were made even more skewed and male biased by, in Anglophone Africa at least, patriarchal Victorian values that came with British colonialism. And you can make exactly the same sorts of arguments for French colonialism and so on. And so the irony is that we very often have a situation in which the rights and roles and situations that women might have had in quote-unquote traditional societies prior to colonialism get more and more truncated and skewed through colonialism and as a process of the development of capitalist individualism. And this process is not recognized so that what we're left with is that this very, very male biased version is then validated as our traditional culture at, without recognizing that culture itself is something that, that changes and has always done so. So, in order to work on ways of leadership training that, oh my goodness, Manaz. There were ways of leadership training that could take account of some of these disadvantages. We tried to lay a very heavy stress on the participatory, on a case study method as being concrete and contextual and able to share experiences without being didactic. Because what you do with case studies, of course, is that you look at what people did in other situations, and then you think about, is this anything like what we have? Can we use it? Can't we use it? Okay. Um, and in doing that, the, one of the things I should have mentioned, of course, about the participatory approach is that we're beginning to have to recognize that participatory means enabling people to participate, to join in, to talk, to be part of what's happening. But at the same time, if we're talk about, talking about participatory training, I think we have to recognize that we're doing two things at the same time. We are having a goal in mind about things that we want to learn, but we are also bearing in mind that 
the things that we want to learn will be enriched by, joining on, by drawing on multiple diversities of people's experiences as we're going. What we referred to this morning as the, the unexpected things that you learn along the way from the participatory approach. Because I think what, often what we forget is that most knowledge is not completely new. It's putting together things that we knew in a slightly different way or seeing them from a, from, a, from a different angle. And having lots of people with lots of different points of view is precisely what does that. So now I want to talk just a very little bit about having developed this, this manual, and the idea was to develop a broad manual that people would adapt to local situations. We, we, we tried it out in Nigeria in five different areas, in, or, sorry, with five different groups. And I'm going to read to you some of the things that those groups had. And I just tell you, the groups were, on the one hand, young women's rights activists. So young women who define themselves also already as rights activists, but who also felt that they didn't have very much experience, very much skills, and that they needed leadership training. We worked with people who were more ex experienced groups of activists, not all of them women, okay, but all concerned about women's rights issues. And we also worked with domestic workers, all of them women, most of them nannies, for other people's children. And one of the things that we were happy to find was that whilst the domestic workers in particular initially defined leadership as requiring high levels of education, high social status, and a lot of experience and other things that they didn't have, by the end of the third session, they were clearly saying, I can do this. I have leadership. This is something that we can do. And one of the things that uh, somebody said, which was particularly important, I think, was, I didn't want to go because I felt that I didn't even have any rights to come close to somebody who was educated, to talk to them. But now we've come to this training, I feel that even without education, I still have my own rights to stand for myself and say, this is what is good, this is what is bad. And I learned how to share my problems and other things. So I think in terms of that, what we found in Nigeria, what the, the groups in Morocco, the groups in Palestine have also reported is that overall, that there was a feeling that people were being empowered, that people were recognizing in themselves leadership skills that they hadn't realized that they have and that they could develop. But more than that, and that's, that's another nice thing, they were recognizing that, quote, I have been able to acquire knowledge concerning leadership and what goes with it, the responsibilities of being a leader and its pitfalls. Okay? We tend to see leaders as the people who have the answers, the people who are going to solve everything. Okay? Um, but another very good thing, and it relates very much to both the point that uh, Aruna made about institutional change in leadership and Kumi, in terms of Manaz being in the IMF, was somebody else saying, I was able to see the shortcomings of my own organization, so I hope to improve the standards of my organization. It taught me to focus on what's wrong as well as what's right in my organization. This is from one of the young women's, women's rights activists. And the final thing that we found extremely useful, and for that the case study method was really, really responsible, I think, was to learn about the experiences of women activists from outside of Nigeria, who took initiatives for positive change. And although it was very clear from the learning experiences afterwards that what makes most sense to most people are situations that are close to their own contexts, everybody found it useful to be able to compare across contexts, even if some contexts were more difficult to understand and make sense of than others. Now I think we, we move to the issues of um, of what lessons and challenges have we learned from this initial trying out of the, this leadership training model, module. But I think the first one was something that we learned along the way that has to do with the global and the local. The idea for the project was the Women's Learning Partnerships, which is a US-based organization with three organizations in Africa, as it happens, Africa, Middle East, working with them. And one of the first things that we had to discuss and negotiate and move on is, who's the global and who's the local here? Okay. And so what we ended up with is a recognition that we all need to be participate, otherwise the global is not global. In other words, not to allow one particular local to masquerade as the global, 
okay, which is what happens very much in what has been called globalization in world terms. Okay? And then, of course, we had to work out modalities that worked more or less well for actually doing that, but at least naming and recognizing the issue. The second thing I think that we were commenting on today is the need not to make it too rosy. I think that was the, the phrase that you used, that we've tended, in the case studies, to present the quote-unquote success stories. And of course, not every effort at leadership is successful. Not every organization that works well is able to achieve all its ends or even some of them. And of course, the other thing of course, is that when you get to one particular position, you may well decide that it wasn't good enough and you, have, you set yourself some other goal anyway. But then, so out of that, we need to find a way of frameworking the the training so that we recognize both the pitfalls and the possible failures without seeing it as so intimidating that we can't go forward and do anything at all. Okay. I think another thing that we have learned is that we need to do something about follow-up. It's not enough to give training. What happens then when people are working on it or developing? Where is it going to go from there? And oddly enough, it was raised in today's session, but it was also raised in the training sessions that we did with, with domestic workers. And they were the people who said clearly that they wanted to have the possibility of developing a domestic workers, a women domestic workers association, which currently doesn't exist in Nigeria, but that would continue to do training with Baobab, which was my organization, with the assumption that after a little while, they would take on the training themselves with other members of their constituency. Okay. Um, I think a third point that we've also learned is, and it, again, it, this relates back to the local and global, is that the original idea was one international manual and local variations, a Moroccan variation, a Nigerian variation, a Palestinian variation. And I think there's a strong feeling out of today's meeting, and certainly there was a strong feeling in Nigeria when we were discussing it, that what we need really is one manual that brings together case studies that were developed in Morocco, in Nigeria, in Palestine, elsewhere, that everybody has access to. Because when you're using manuals, you always do adapt. You pick and choose what you want. But to have, for the Nigerians to have access to the kinds of case studies that the Moroccans developed, Okay, or for the Brazilians to have access to the kinds of case studies that the Nigerians developed enriches everybody. So instead of having a Nigerian version that only Nigerians see, we would, we're, we're considering working on a version that brings together all the resources for everybody, but bearing in mind that the version in English needs to be accessible to people who are working in English as a second, third, sometimes fourth language. So there are things about whose idioms do you use which, where do you pitch the level of language comprehension, and so on. Similarly, the version in French needs to read, not as a translation from English, but as something that is worked on and works with people who speak French as a first language or a second language or a third language, <laughs> but that's not seen as, this is your local version. Likewise, the version in Arabic. So that if you like, we'll have three versions, all of which are quote-unquote original copies. So, and finally, and this relates to the point that Aruna made, I think that we certainly from our experience in Nigeria started recognizing that the question of leadership for what was very important. Because somewhere along the line, the idea of the Women's Leadership Manual did bring out the issues of learning validating and listening, collaborating, being inclusive. But the gender specificity, the need to be awareness, aware of gender issues and how they impact on any particular context, somehow that didn't really get brought out strongly. So we've got to go back to the manual and do that all over again. And I think, I think Manaz gave me extra time. <laughs> so... I think those, for me, were the four major challenges out of the experience we had of trying to develop the manual and trying to pilot test the manual. And now we have to take those away and work on them because this is a work in process. Leadership development is always a work in progress. Thank you.
Well, uh, I would like to thank the uh, speakers for these extraordinary contributions uh, that set forth issues related to leadership from the general uh, uh, abstract to the very concrete experiments that were carried out in localities in Middle East uh, and, uh, and Africa. And uh, uh, we, were we were going to have about half an hour or so for uh, question and answer. I just want to make uh, one uh, comment about this toilet issue. <laughs> <laughs> We had abstract references to it, but as, a, as one woman cabinet member in a cabinet of 20 men, I've had concrete local indigenous experience of it. <laughs> and I can tell you that it is a factor, uh, which is both culturally and contextually uh, relevant. So before we go on, um, well, actually, let's, let's just begin with, with questions and answers. There are two mics on the uh, two sides uh, of the room. So who, could you please line up wherever is closest to you? Please, yes, go ahead. Um, just a... Uh, no. It's a microphone, right? Uh, just a short question. Uh, after that, please. Uh, um, the question is as follows. Um, I think people do not disagree so much if you propose that full participation by women is required in a democracy because that's part of the definition of democracy, including equality. So people do not disagree with you about that. That's a very trivial statement. What people will fight you to the death, however, is how are you going to achieve that? That is the same debate in the civil rights movement. How are you going to achieve equality? Through affirmative action program or through some other program? That is the disagreement. And that is the challenge. I think it's much more constructive for you to spend more time talking about what exactly are the options available for women to achieve that goal than to say we need to do that. That's obvious. Who could say that we should not do that? Secondly, the question about gender and nurture debate. Now, people do not disagree with you either that, well, there's some genetic, there's some environment that are equally important or something like that. But the disagreement, however, is which factor is more important. That is how we disagree. For you to say, therefore, that we do not know anything about genetic factor because all of them are so messed up with the environment, the culture, the social constructionism, that is a dishonesty in the face of science and also a dishonesty to yourself. And that has a profound implication for identity formation, not just for women, but for men as well, too. I think that we should open up more the debate about how you are going to know yourself. Otherwise, the construction of new identity that you're going to have, unless you know more about yourself within yourself as a person, you might end up making up an identity which is not good for yourself. That requires some understanding of the genetic factor of okay. a person. Now we have the human Thank you. Project. Thank you very much for the question. That might be the next step we need to look at, and therefore do not deny the debate. That is very fundamental. That is what we need, need to look into. And science knows a lot about this so far, except we cannot disagree about the gradation and the construction of that. Thank That's you. Thank you for the question. Let's take two or three, and then we'll get... Uh, Thank you very much. My please. question is based to all this, this because, I mean, history has proved that um, gender dimensions have put um, all the issues of women on the output. But what I want to know, when and how are we going to address three embedded issues which are taking place locally, nationally, globally? One, the culture, power, and traditions, which are still prevailing in our lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thais? I'll take the, can I take the mic? I think I can. Yeah, my question is for Aruna, because uh, I would like you to articulate uh, a bit further these three dimensions you mentioned, the individual, the organizational, and the institutional. Because all that I learned is that uh, um, leadership is also about pace and sequency. So how do you see the sequence of that? Is there any, any of these levels that have to come first? They, it's a matter of opportunity. So how, how do you, do you how, how do you see that, this, this interrelation in time also? 
I, I just wanted to uh, reiterate certain things. One is that having been part of a student's movement in India and then part of different grassroots movement and having worked with different women's groups at the grassroots level and the community level, I find that uh, we really cannot approach uh, gender equity in politics in the same way that we approach gender equity in economic development and social development and violence against women. Because here we are really dealing with powers that be, powers that go and, ha I mean, where the underlying, um, uh, uh, you, you have underlying violence, you have underlying corruption, and where like anybody is willing to uh, undertake a coup to overthrow power. So it's, it's really, it's, it's a very different kind of challenge. And I think we really need to think along those terms is we are dealing with political powers and dealing with uh, overthrowing power. And, and that has been mentioned, I'm just reiterating. And I, I think we really need to think about that in terms of gender equity in politics. Thank you. Uh, yes, go ahead. Mine is just a comment. Uh, in reference to the, um, the young man's um, intervention. And uh, when I hear interventions like that, I, I it just, I'm happy that all the speakers have identified the need for us to work with men. Because maybe he hasn't noticed it, but the powers are with the men. We want to snatch this power or share in the power. So the resistance is from the men. <laughs> So if the men are sincere, it has to be, first of all, the formation of effective partnership with men. Then secondly, the sincerity of the men to let go of some of the power. And in so doing, all the nations that signed the affirmative action would have implemented the affirmative action and shifted some power to women. So it has to be the sincerity of the men. So the young man, yes, we, we can only effect this with the support of you men letting go of some of the powers and since you are the ones sitting at the helms of affairs of all the nations you just have to implement the institutional changes processes that are already in place or uh, uh, globally and get it down to the national level that's my comment. thank you thank you uh, should we get some of the answers and then yeah uh, so shall we start just down the line aruna and just address whichever question you like yeah, um, I'd just like to uh, comment on uh, Thais's um, point. Um, what I was trying to show was that at, we've gone through, I think, different, at different periods of time, stressing different assumptions about how change happens. And partly that's a, that's a practical choice, because it's not that people uh, or, or feminist activists have been unaware of the, the or haven't visualized what, you know, the nature of what needs to be changed. But they've been, um, at various points in time, I think, very strong um, ideologies of thinking about how change happens. One of them is this obvious one that, you know, change happens as it's a rational decision-making process, that if you give people information, and that if you, you equip them with skills that they can then use to make change happen, then change will happen. Um, and so therefore, a, a lot of resources and thinking and energy has gone into working at the individual level. I'm not saying that, that any one of those levels um, should be privileged over others. All of those are needed, it's just that each one of us, I mean, I think after doing or working on gender training for 10 years or so, it was, it was very clear to many of us that the systemic work that needed to happen in conjunction with the individual change work was not happening. That we sort of got stuck at working at the individual change work. Uh, some similar example is if you work on policy. I mean, a lot of effort goes into changing policy and working on policies. Um, and, and not very much goes into thinking about institutional change. So it's, it's not an either or or which comes before which. I think uh, it, the key thing is that each one of us, regardless of where we work, should have, uh, should have an understanding of these other levels, sort of like the way Kumi was talking about it. And we probably need to work much more at how we can link them systematically. 
um, because otherwise you are talking at, at an abstract level when you're talking about change in institutional arrangements. But when you tie it to micro level you know, work and, and work at policy levels as well as meso kinds of organizations, then it makes more sense. It's more real what the solutions could be. Okay. Well, first I, I have to tell my toilet story. Uh, <laughs> because I think it's rather interesting and I feel confirmed when I, the first time I ever went to the Commission on Human Rights in Geneva uh, in 1992, which is held in the old Palais um, uh, from the League of Nations building, I walked out of the Commission meeting and I needed to go to the bathroom. I headed toward a door that I thought were bathrooms and I saw a sign that said men, so I thought fine, there must be one for women on the other side. And literally directly out the door, there was a bathroom for men, and I turned to the other side, and there was another bathroom for men. <laughs> <laughs> and about halfway down the hall, what would take you at least three or four minutes in the midst of heavy political negotiating, valuable time, uh, was a very small bathroom for women. But it was a strategic location for that yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So I agree, and I said to myself that day, I said, the day they transform one of these two into a bathroom for women, we will know that women have made a difference in this <laughs> setting. Um, that transformation has not happened, however, I will report that at the UN in New York, just prior to Beijing plus five, they did transform a larger men's bathroom into the women's bathroom uh, and took the smaller women's one and made it another men's bathroom. So at least small changes. Um, I, I, I want to say um, one comment in relation to both um, the woman's comment uh, from India about the difficult challenge of politics and also uh, the young man's comment about uh, democracy and disagreement in politics. I, I actually think that the question of how we do this is very important. And I think it is precisely important because of what you said that we are talking in the political realm about the, the representation of power. Uh, now, I think there's a lot of other power uh, in the economic sphere that's often as important as political power, but in symbolic terms, that political power is where we associate the notion of who's in control. Um, so I think you're absolutely right that it is therefore very particular the kind of challenge that political power represents. I also think that there are a number of very creative uh, ideas uh, around different kinds of quotas and affirmative action that are being tried in the world that I think are rather interesting. And, and my comment about the U.S. is I think the U.S. is very backward in its utter resistance to even discussing these. Uh, and, and that there is a kind of almost a, a, a knee-jerk reaction against all of these discussions in the United States. And, and I think we who work in the U.S. have to challenge that as a, a resistance to trying to make our democracy more a real democracy. Uh, and I think there are many issues about what it means to make democracy real in the US. Money is, of course, a big part of it. Uh, but all of these things uh, are part of those challenges. I don't, however, agree. I think he left. Did he leave? No. Oh, there you are. I don't, however, agree that there's no, disagree that there's no um, disagreement about that. Because I actually think that the, the challenge is how to do it. But I think there's lots and lots of people particularly men, but even women, who don't necessarily agree that democracy has to be representative to be democracy. Uh, we wouldn't have hundreds of years of an unrepresented democracy in this country, much less other places of the world, if everybody had already come to agree with this. So I don't think even that argument is settled while I accept, um, I, while I accept that the really important job is to talk about how. Uh, the, the final thing about the nature and nurture debate, my point is quite simple. It's not to say that there's nothing that anybody knows about it. It's to say that we have been so socialized for so long that I think that the really important work we need to be doing is to change the social conditions that have prevented women from having this access. And in so doing, we can also be pursuing questions of science, but I am afraid in the political climate of the day, questions of science get used for political purpose. Uh, and therefore, I'm more interested in the pursuit of changing the political conditions, and then maybe someday we can have science that isn't being used for political purpose that would be interesting around these questions. Thank you. Wait until the end, please. Wait until, wait, please wait until the end. Uh, okay, come here. 
I really miss university. <laughs> <laughs> to your question about how does one deal with culture, power, and tradition, um, I think the short answer is with a hell of a lot of difficulty. I think if we are honest about it, uh, I do not think that we have responded with the right kind of skill, knowledge, sensitivity, and so on that actually is called for. What I do think, though, is that it's a challenge that needs to be met. I believe it can be met. And each of those different things, I think there's a different, when we talk about culture, I think that requires a particular set of ways of thinking about it. Power is something somewhat different. And power, I think, particularly institutional power, there's more options of challenging it. And tradition, again, is, is different. What I think, though, is we have to also recognize is that culture and tradition is changing all the time, that we have to ask questions about how much of culture and tradition is male-constructed. Um, Labola, for example, in, in our context, in, uh, Labola is bride, bride price. Um, now, let's assume, for example, we accept the notion I'm not saying we accept it, but let's say we accept the notion of bride price. In the old days, you took, you had to give so many cows to get a, uh, a bride. But the way that gets distorted when we think about the issues of violence against women at home is the, the culture doesn't say because you gave so many cows and you married the uh, person X, therefore she is your property and you can beat her. Okay, so we also have to look at how culture has been distorted in a whole range of ways uh, by men. But I think that, for me, that question you raise goes to the heart, in the end, of why this is such a huge challenge. And in fact, I think, I hope, this weekend, <laughs> at the, an event that we're having around Taking Folks Gender and Institutional Transformation Network, that we are able to factor that in as a central part of how we think about meeting this challenge. And, and just to add to um, Kumi's comment on culture, uh, there is the male interpreted and, and uh, hierarchical and patriarchal interpretations and, and practices, but there are also, as we all have experienced, uh, a great deal that is uh, woman friendly and human rights friendly in all of these cultures. Mm. And the effort that is being put into identifying these uh, aspects, whether it be in religious and spiritual texts and practices or whether it be in other practices, uh, to bring these forth and use them in support of uh, justice and equity has been a very useful uh, activity, I think, supportive activity. Aisha, you want to go? Yes. Um, I also want to make a comment on the question that you raised, but I would add to culture, power, and tradition, religion. and. What I'm going to do is, is mostly base it on a particular practice, which may or may not be useful for your own situation, okay? Um, well, what we do in Baobab is work with, in the issue of, of culture, religion, and tradition, all of which we see as different um, forms of belief systems, okay? Which are more or less institutionalized in, certain, in particular social practices, yeah? Um, we begin with an analysis of belief systems and gender that looks precisely at who's constructing what we begin to accept as the religion or the culture and the tradition and the history and the circumstances in which that construction occurred. Because that straight away breaks down the notion that reli religious practices are immediately divinely given or that all tradition has been there exactly like that for time immemorial, okay? or that this is the culture and it cannot change. Because immediately you start looking at it, any specific culture or religion or tradition, you see that it has a history. And that history is influenced by who is it that had power at the time, what were the circumstances in which it happened, whose interpretations gained currency because they had the power to enforce them. Okay. So one of the things that we, we find in that is that if, we, if you give a couple of examples of how this works. It enables people to break out of that fear that of challenging religion, culture, and tradition, and therefore thereby being seen as outside of their community, de-groupized, de whatever your group is. You know. In my case, 
anti-Muslim, um, Western-influenced, whatever, okay? For example, um, TIV customary law, the TIV is one particular ethnic group in the middle belt of Nigeria. When the British were ruling, they had decided that for things they considered important, like taxation, they would have British laws. For things they didn't think were very important, like who married who and who inherited what from whom, we could have our own quote-unquote native law and custom. Okay, this is what was called indirect rule. But they thought that they were responsible for maintaining law and order. So how are they going to maintain it if they don't know what our native law and custom is? They've got to write it down. How do they write it down? Coming from patriarchal, male-dominated Victorian culture, they assumed that it's male elders, old male, old men with power in the community who can tell them all this. So the only people they ask are elderly Tiv men. They don't ask young Tiv people, women or men. They don't ask Tiv women. And in fact, one of the interesting things is that there's actually an anthropological account that's complaining about these irritating old women who keep coming around and trying to break in on their serious discussions with the men. <laughs> <laughs> but the irony is that it's this account that, is now be, that then became institutionalized in customary courts, so-called Tiv customary courts, as the Tiv culture. Okay, so once you start looking at the history of how different rights develop, how different things develop, you can start moving away from the idea that it just happened like this, it was God-given, and that enables women and other disadvantaged groups to start saying, hey, listen, we have a stake and a right to define what is the culture, okay, and that it's not a culture unless we are part of the definition of it, okay. One of the things that, and this relates also to the issue of power, because in doing this, one of, what, one of the things that we did was start having, quote unquote, ordinary women participate in defining, the, in, in the research, in finding out these things, what's actually happening on the ground, what used to happen in the past, how can we understand it, in particular in terms of religious law, because the dominant idea about Muslim religious law, in particular, is that it's very conservative, it doesn't recognize women's rights, and so on. We have all these men saying, Islam says there shall be four, four wives to a man, etc., etc. And if you question it, all you get is you're being anti-Islam, you're influenced by the West, etc., etc. So one of the things that we did was we did this research and women looked at their communities and they looked at the text, at the history of Muslim, Muslim laws and in Muslim societies, and they came up with things like the verses in the Quran on polygyny are verses that imply a conditionality, first of all, and that, that sorry, that they, they say something like, um, if you cannot be satisfied with one, then marry two, three, up to four, but of the women of your hand, but it's better to marry only one because you must treat them justly and it's impossible to treat your wives justly. Okay, on the basis of these exact same verses, and everybody is, agrees with this, that's what the verses say, you have some Muslim communities as in northern Nigeria where I come from, where men consider it as virtually their religious duty to marry four wives. <laughs> <laughs> Some communities, as in Senegal, where the attempt at least has been that if a, if a woman and a man get married, at the first marriage, the man must say, is this going to be a monogamous marriage or is it going to be two or three or four wives with the the possibility, which unfortunately doesn't work out so well in practice, the theory is that if she doesn't want to have a polygynous marriage, she then has the possibility of deciding from the outset that she will not marry this man or that she will marry him knowing that she's going to be more than one wife. To other societies, as in Tunisia apparently, where the, the focus is very clearly that since it says to marry one is preferable, that's what we will have in the law and Tunisia is a Muslim society, but it's monogamy in Tunisia. So who is it that decided in those particular societies which was going to be the religious law and on what basis they, they decide? Once you start doing that deconstruction and making that available to women and letting women do that construct, deconstruction, it makes it much easier to start challenging the kind of power that comes from mobilizing claims of religion, culture and tradition against women. Well, one final, well, actually, two questions, and that's it. We have to. Uh, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. And could you? Oh, okay. You Thank you very much uh, for having this session. I'm going to try to ask my question very briefly, which might be difficult. 
I think that the question that you raised, Charlotte, about women's leadership for what is a real critical one. And, and, and for me, Aisha, your example about the group of women that you worked with, were they domestic workers? I can't remember that are now talking about forming an organization and then partnering and being able to train them. Led me to come back to what Aruna was talking about in terms of institution and institutional change and that perhaps maybe part of the answer to women's leadership for what is that we want to create new institutions. So my question for, for all of you then is how do we do that? Uh, Aruna, do we do it by working at you know, the institutions we have in society, religion, family, and then also organizational culture, kinds of things that, that uh, you define as, as uh, institutions by uh, holding up the mirror, using those kinds of techniques within institutions. And how do we begin to get that process to work in an organization if you don't have the political will? Or does it only have to come from senior people in organizations or institutions to say we're willing to have this dialogue? Or is it possible to have that dialogue come from people who are not the decision makers in institutions to say, yes, we will talk about you know, transforming our institutions? Or do you think that maybe the way that we go about that is by developing new organizations that then build their own new, different, more equitable uh, kinds of values and practices and then try to get those institutions to replace the old ones? I mean, Thank I you. don't know if I made my well, question clear. Your yeah. question will take, I think, a whole other I conference. Know, but I know. we'll see what we can but do. But if you tell us how we can be on that dialogue, <laughs> then we can talk some more about it as well. Okay. Thank you. Please, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm from Bangladesh and I'm very happy to see one panelist from Bangladesh who has been working in BRAC, the uh, largest uh, uh, NGO in the world. And uh, well, uh, my country is a very adventitious situation because our Prime Minister is a lady and opposition leader is also a lady. So in Bangladesh, uh, I think that our women's leadership is, uh, double, is developing and uh, what I felt that in this discussion, one thing is basic, that is empowerment of women. Because without the empowerment of women, then if you talk about the democracy or good governance, I think that it, is, it will be difficult to sustain the democracy or some, pro may some uh, problems for the good governance. So what is our uh, understanding is that you're, uh, you are doing an excellent work, I think, this forum. And in Bangladesh, I'm also heading a project that is called the Institutional Development of Human Rights in Bangladesh. And from my experience, I can uh, tell this uh, August gathering that uh, women in our country is very much interested to participate uh, in the policy making process. So, and we have drafted the National Human Rights Commission, uh, particularly uh, uh, by, uh, by uh, exercising the participatory rural appraisal methodology. So I think that these are my few comments uh, about my country. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Can, can we have, uh, we really are finished with this, uh, uh, with the questions. We have to quit. Um, uh, do, do you, does anybody want to comment or briefly maybe, take a minute or so to comment on what we have? Those are comments. Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, I, we, we, we want to say something? Okay, well, we have a comment from Aruna and uh, Will uh, I think it's a trick question, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> you <try. laughs> um, I feel really, I feel really debilitated because I don't have a toilet story, but um, <laughs> 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 I, don't, I don't think I can answer your question. I don't have a toilet story. <laughs> Um, and I think you know as well as I do that the kind of work that you and I do is, is sort of, again, it's one slice of the picture. And it's one slice of the picture where all of the other things need to happen. And we, uh, you, you cannot do one piece of it without connecting to a political constituency, without connecting to what you know, Kumi calls this sort of, you know, this macro level work of changing institutions and institutional arrangements. So, you know, I think, I think you, you know that, and I, that's why I'm sh I, I know it's a trick question you got. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, uh, I'm very sorry. There's still some uh, questions out there, but, but we have to quit. Some have to take planes. And, and so thank you very much for your patience and, and for being with us. And thanks to our wonderful panelists for their presentation.